Hey guys, it's Rinda Smith. Um, I will wait. Welcome to the show. I'll wait till some people get in and um, then we'll get going. It's good to be back on uh, live stream. Um, like I said, waiting on everybody to come in and uh, then we'll get started on tonight's topic of trauma bonding and the effects it has on the brain. So as you come in, let me know if you're here. Um, say hi so that we can go ahead and get started. See, four of you guys are coming in. I know you clicked on the screen tonight and you're like, oh, Rinda's here. So um, say hi, check in. Let me know that you're here watching. Hey, Suzanne. <coughs> I think you guys will find the topic interesting this evening. Um, I'm going to be talking about trauma bonding. Hey, Sharon. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Shagun. Um, so I'm going to talk about trauma bonding and the effects that it has on the brain. Um, so, um, hey, Annie. Hey, Diane. Um, I'm glad you guys are with me. So um, I'm going to let's just kind of chit chat back and forth and give some other people some t a, ch a chance to come in because I, th I think that this is a really good topic and um, it's some good information. I've been researching this um, for a little while and the universe kind of spoke to me and said, now's the time to talk about it. Um, so uh, so here I am. I'm going to talk about it tonight. Um, you guys check in. How are you guys doing during this um I don't know, pandemic and, and this social distancing and all this other stuff here in Myrtle Beach. Um, it's like it never even happened. Um, our tourism is up and hotels are up. And, you know, so that's that. So, um, like I said, I'm going to give it a few minutes um, to let some other people come in. Um, yay for Rinda, Mark says. Um, so Mark is here also. Um, and so he's, he's just on the other end. Um, still, and he's still staying safe at home. Yeah. I don't blame you. Um, so, all right, well, let's go ahead and without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, and start presenting the information that, um, I came to present tonight. And the topic is trauma bonding again, trauma bonding and the effects that it has on the brain. Um, so thank you, Mark, um, for the compliment. So what is trauma bonding? Trauma bonding is it's creating a, a bond with somebody who hurts us. So if we look at this in, in the types of attachments that we that we have as children, um, we, we bond to our parent. And if our parent is an abusive parent, you know, like mine was, then you you form these anxious or anxious avoidant type of attachments to them. Um, and then what happens is that sets us up for what happens um, later on in life in, in our relationships. Um, it sets us, it's, it's characterized by an unhealthy pattern that's made stronger through cruel treatment and labeling it as love. So, um, so in the sense of a narcissistic relationship, let's just take this one. Um, it's, it's the idealization, the devalue, the discard, and then the hoovering. So that, that continues. That's the idealization, the, the devalue, the discard, and then the hoovering back in. But what's, what traps us into that is that these early relationships that we formed with our parents. So, like I said, in my case, the attachment that I formed with my mother was an anxious avoidant attachment because she was abusive and it set me up later in life um, to excuse behavior um, that was the otherwise harmful. Because as a kid, you can't wrap your brain around like somebody's being mean to you. It's the person um, who's supposed to be protecting you, who's supposed to be nurturing you, who's supposed to be giving you that love. And so what happens is we become bonded to the chemistry and making excuses for the abuse and the harm because we've learned that that's love. And, and as kids, we can't differentiate 
and justify the behavior um, and, and we, we justify the behavior as children because we're just trying to make it through. Right. And so inevitably what happens to us is when we get into adult relationships, other relationships, whether romantic or friendships, Oh, Peyton's killing the mouse. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, her squeaky mouse. She, she has a toy that she plays. So let me get back to, um, so that we, this tr bond that we form is the chemistry, right? And so we, our brain feeds on this adrenaline rush that we get from abuse because as children, we were set up for this and we equate that to love. So how do we go about breaking the trauma bond? Um, and he says, um, I did this with my, with my narc spouse when he was angry and cruel. I blamed myself and was taught to do this as a child. Exactly. That is exactly how we, we rationalize it as children because, you know, this person is responsible for taking care of us. And so if we don't have them, then we don't have anybody to take care of us. So we get, we get into this vicious cycle. And then, like I said, it carries on. But what happens in our brain is that, um, so we have, you know, the, the, the frontal cortex, which is the thinking part of our brain, but then we have the, the animal part of our brain, which is the hippocampus and, um, the amygdala. And, and so what happens is when, because we are traumatized, it's our hippocampus shrinks and, and our lizard brain, right? Our lizard brain increases. And so it releases our, all this cortisol and, and all these chemicals into our body and then we become accustomed to it and then we seek it right so because of the trauma that we've that we've that we've endured as children we seek it in our other relationships and and we, we and so as a, a typical adult children of alcoholic right one of the things is one of the 14 characteristics is addict, addicted to excitement. And that addiction to ex excitement is that increase of cortisol and, and oxytocin that releases in our body when we have this increased heightened state. So it's it's kind of like um, we have this addiction and, and for lack of better way to explain it, it's like we shoot heroin and, and we, and we, we can't get enough. We can't get enough of it and we become addicted to it. So we seek it out just like an addict seeks out their drug or, as, you know, Patrick Carnes, um, he really started um, coining this term uh, trauma bonding when it comes to sexual addictions and other types of addictions, because you're feeding that insatious need. And so when, when we withdraw from that toxicity of a relationship, what do we do? Well, oftentimes we go back, we go back and we go back because our life is otherwise boring. Um, so we think, and it's because of this chemical release that's going in our body, right? Are you guys following me so far? Cause everybody's like really quiet. Um, and so if you've got questions, please in capital letters, put question at the beginning of it so that I can catch it. Um, just so that, um, I can try to get as many questions in as I, as I can throughout this presentation. Um, so when, when we are presented in, um, in healthy relationships, right, we oftentimes find them boring because we don't have the drug. Okay. Just taking it all in. And he says, good. Um, and uh, Dr. Romney on YouTube, um, actually, she was talking about she was talking about this as I was doing the research on this. And she said, it's kind of like um, going and playing the slots. And so I'm playing this silly little game on Facebook and it's called Thug Life. And and um, and there is some excitement about, oh, I'm going to I'm going to get to raid somebody or I'm going to get to, you know, take somebody's corner, blow up their property. And so 
So she, she equates this to um, playing the slots, right? We stay in these relationships because it's like playing the slots. Sometimes it's going to pay off. And, you know, it paid off for this other person. She was saying it paid off for this other person. So if I stay long enough, then I'm going to get a big payout too. But oftentimes, yeah, thug like makes me very happy, especially when I'm blowing up my sister. So, um, and so oftentimes when we're, we're playing the slots. We keep on playing. It's just like me playing this silly little game. It's like one more spin and maybe, maybe I'll hit and be able to get all these points, but you know, get all these other spins and then I can go blow up my sister's property. So it's, it's equating that to, you know, like a slot machine. We're taking a gamble. We're taking a gamble. The longer we stay in a toxic relationship. Right. And so what happens when we, when we are in these, toxic relationships is so you've got that the the for lack of a better term I guess the the abuser will say that um and 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 this this person's got all these negative tr negative things negative depletions in them and that they need and it's often us that they find in this kind compassionate caring loving supportive like all these positive attributes that they're lacking. And um, so, so what happens is this negative, this minus person that doesn't have all these positives, they feed and feed and feed and feed and feed off of the positivity of this person. And this person, not really knowingly, um, it, because of the trauma bond, is building this person up and putting them back together, they're rescuing, they're, you know, and, and not realizing that they're depleting themselves, right? And this other person, they're just taking and taking and taking and taking, and they're not getting anything in return. They're not giving anything in return mm -hmm. to help this person that's depleted. And so, um, so what happens is this person over here one day wakes up and says, hey, wait a minute. I'm not getting a whole lot from this. And I think I'm just going to take my pluses and I'm going to go over here. And then the person with all the minuses is like, hey, where'd all the pluses go? I want more pluses. I want more pluses. Well, in a healthy relationship, there's pluses, pluses going on both sides, right? So I'm giving and you're giving and we're all giving and it's all good and it's all happy. But when, when in, an, in an abusive relationship, um, you see the book called the little bucket J Bates says, I haven't read that book. Um, but it sounds interesting. Um, so, so anyway, what happens is, um, this person over here gets depleted and then they take the toys and they go over here and they, they go in the corner. Okay. And, um, and then the person here says, well, why, why did you take your toys and run? Um, it is a hard lesson. Um, it is a hard lesson to learn J Bates. Um, but we, what, how we, how we get through this is, um, we have to, we have to resource our own. Right. And so, you know, J Bates says the, the little bucket and it is, we're filling our own ba bucket back up. So we have to stop and regroup and fill our own bucket up. But when we're trauma bonded, um, when we're trauma bonded to a person, we are continuously addicted to the cycle. Okay. We're addicted to the cycle and we keep going back and that's why it's so hard. And, and, you know, people say, people say that, why can't you just leave? Why can't you just get over it? Well, it's, it's not that easy when your brain chemistry is wired from here, from a very early age, wired to be attracted to people who are inherently like your parents, then you're just recreating this pattern over and over and over again within your life. And so to get out of it, um, to get out of it, you've really got to, um, to do a lot of work on yourself and having a really, really, really good therapist that can help you identify the patterns that you are 
repeating over and over because and and you're staying in a a trauma bonded relationship because that's really all you know right uh, jay bait said schools teach children to fill each other's bucket codependency is a standard unconscious way of teaching relationship go inward most definitely go inward but understanding like why you go why the i guess the deeper meaning for me is understanding like why I've allowed myself to be in relationships where I, I don't get um, what I've always wanted, which was love and acceptance and just the ability for me to be me and that be enough. Um, but for whatever reason, because of my childhood, me being me was never enough and it wasn't acceptable to my mother. So therefore, I always tried and tried and tried and I gave away and gave away and gave away till I was depleted. And then it just basically became, you become invisible, you keep your mouth shut, you don't have any wants, desires or anything else. And then you get along fine. Well, that doesn't really work well for me in adult relationship because, you know, I have this idealistic kind of like, I don't know, give and take in a relationship. Um, and that's what I desire. That's what I want. That's what I want in a partner and a spouse is, is a co-equal where my togetherness is just as important as yours togetherness. And, and so we share in that. And, and it's been really, really hard um, to get out of my childhood trauma bonding um, and this pattern that I've learned and it's so ingrained in me. And it feels, it feels like my life had been out of control when I didn't have the trauma bond, right? And, you know, to some extent, I think that when you're trauma bonded, it is very, very hard to, to step back from it and, and to regroup. Um, so let me check my notes. For, I know that we're, I, there's a lot of information. You guys have any questions so far about the information that I've presented? Um, I'm going to check my notes real quick and then check in with you guys and see and get some of your thoughts. And then we can uh, go into another part of this about like how to, um, work on separating yourself and like more into of like how we can un, un traumatize our brain. Okay. So you guys, um, if you've got any, um, questions, go ahead and ask them and I'm going to check my notes my cool glasses, um, <clears throat> dirty glasses at that. Um, so, um, one of the things too, that I was learning is that, you know, abusive relationships is what happens in this trauma bonding thing is we continuously make, um, <laughs> we continue to make, excuses um, for the bad behaviors of others, right? So when we're taught that uh, the bad behavior that, that our parents, how they're treating us, it is bad. And we, we make excuses for it because we're trying to wrap our mind about around it. And so when we trauma bond with a partner, then it is, it's difficult because we're still trying to rationalize that bad behavior and trying to make an excuse somewhere in our mind to say, oh, it's excusable and it's okay because chaos, bad treatment equals love. And that's, that's what we've learned back here from our parent. So Mark had a question. Mark said, why is building a co-equal relationship so difficult? Well, um, probably because we've never done it before. And so it's, it's, it's about, learning to coexist um, in healthy ways and about um, diving deeper into our childhood and really understanding the effect that your childhood had on you and what you bring into the relationship. And it's not about diagnosing your partner. It's about really saying, hey, um, and having authenticity and saying, hey, this is what's coming up for me. And not having the other person say, well, you know, you, um, it's about taking responsibility, right? So being co-equal is, is about carrying your fair share. And so abusers like to say, and this is some of the research that I was doing 
Um, and this guy came from a, I can't think of his name right off the top of my head, but he came from a biblical sense. And, and I know that some of you aren't all into the, the biblical sense of it, but what he made sense, what he said made sense. And I'll leave the biblical references out of it. Um, but what he said is that, um, oh, it's not, I just, I just lost it. Um, I wrote it down. Abusers have an inappropriate response, uh, an inappropriate assignment of responsibility, um, right? And so, oftentimes, people who are depleted on this on this minus size, they will usually say to the person, "Well, you made me do that. I wouldn't have done it if you wouldn't have blah blah blah." So. Um, it's, it's this misappro misappropriation of responsibility, but in a co-equal relationship, the person can go and they can say, oh, I did that because of my own issue, right? It wasn't, oh, you didn't answer your phone. So therefore you made me yell at you, right? Um, that's just the, you know, you answering, not answering your phone. There could be millions of reasons for not answering your phone, but it doesn't force somebody to be raging or, you know, it's their own abandonment issue that caused it, whatever reaction that they're having. And so, you know, and then having a boundary that's saying that it's not OK to yell and scream at me because I didn't answer my phone. That's 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 a healthy boundary. Right. So J Bates said, and usually it's about you, not about the other person. If something comes up for you and you think it's about the other person, it's a lesson that you're learning. And that's exactly true. And, and so, you know, throughout my relationship with Mark, it, it's like I'm learning all these valuable lessons about me and, and just about how I've interacted in throughout my life and how I've allowed myself to sign up for, you know, um, valuable lessons, just valuable lessons. Like I really and tr truly um, have taken into consideration and like really dug in deep and started learning about more about the, the trauma bonding that I did with my mother that has carried throughout my life and is, is, you know, where I'm at today. And, and it's about healing that. Um, and it's, um, there's a book and it's called, um, Patrick Carnes wrote it. It's called the betrayal bond. Um, that's something too, that has been, I've been listening, I've listened to it before, but I'm listening to it again. And that's, that's been kind of a, that's, that's again, another trauma bond that we have, that we have, that has played out in our childhood. And, and unknowingly we've repeated these patterns over and over and over again. Um, J. Bates says, absolutely and unconsciously rains. Most people are asleep with their shadow. It's painful and scary to look at in the sh at, to, at the shadow. Um, it process work that has taken him, J. Bates, him, I'm assuming, years for it to be worked out. And it does. It takes years and it takes dedication and it takes just a lot of time and patience and understanding with yourself. And, you know, for me, it's been about learning to um, reparent. It's it's been learning to. So there's there's several books that that you know uh, the betrayal bond, um, healing the fragmented um, selves of trauma of, of of childhood trauma. I think that's exact. I don't know the exact name, but it's close enough. Um, healing the fragmented selves of trauma survivors is the name of the book. I really learned a lot from that book. Um, because it, it talks about us having different selves. And, you know, when you've been through a lot of trauma as a child, you tend to separate the, the bad traumatic experiences, get really hidden in your subconscious. And, you know, something will happen. If you guys have ever seen the movie um, Inside Out, it's a really great kids movie, but it explains how memories work. And, um, I'm looking at the little characters here in front of me on my, on my table. But so it, it tells how we process memories. And so when something happens, it goes way back here into this filing cabinet of our brain. And then something can come, something can trigger that. And then they bring that old memory forward. Right. And then it, that's how we have a reaction, right? It's not what's happening here in the present 
that that we get the the that we're responding to it's back here that we're reacting to so we go into kind of a um a reaction state instead of responding in a healthy way so our little kid our our lizard brain takes over and and we react and we we don't think about what we're saying or what we're doing it's just an instinct because what happens is we when we get triggered by this bad memory we go into protective mode um um so you know so we've got to learn how to right parent this little kid back here that was traumatized as a kid but you know in the book um in the fragmented selves it talks about and i teach my clients this too is it talks about having a council of children, right? And I recommend like setting aside a certain time of day um, once a week. Um, and I've and I've done it. I've done it. Um, I've done it for myself. I you know have one day that I set aside an hour, and it really gives me a chance to kind of dive in deep with these little parts of me that are so that are fragmented, and like. I'll be working with somebody and something will come up. And, and so what I've, what I've started doing is if I have a second pad of paper. And so when something comes up, right, I'll write it down and I tell my clients to do this. And, and, you know, I've, I, I've also shared about, you know, tell you, know, when you have this council of children, you know, you're going in, you're going to do this inner child work and you're, because you've got to become this loving parent figure for, for these little kids inside of you that nobody can see. Right. All they see is this person here in front of them. And they so other people outside don't know what you're internally responding to. And so they're just like, wow, you're really being bitchy today or whatever. Um, and he's got a question. I've read that we can get uh, stunted emotionally at the age that our devastating trauma happened. I lost my mother to suicide at age 15. And I feel that my maturity uh, hoovered there for a long time. And that is true. We, we do, um, if you look at some of the um, theorists, um, they, the, the cognitive theorists, they say that um, there's stages of development. So whatever, whatever stage of development that you were in when the trauma happened, oftentimes you are stuck in that um, developmental stage, right? So like for me, for a long time, um, you know, I was stuck in an, an early child, um, because my abuse started actually probably the day that I was born, um, cause I wasn't wanted, but, uh, so, so what happens is we do any, we, it is this, some of the, the theorists, um, Freud and I can't think of the other guy's name off the top of my head. It'll come to me later. Um, they say that, that when we're traumatized, Hey Jilligan, that when we're traumatized, that we we get stuck in that stage of development and aren't able to move on until we can work through it. Um, and then, you know, we, we work through it, you know, hopefully with a professional. Um, so where was I? Um, so, yes, that is true that you get stuck in the age of development. Um, our, our brains are wired to, um, yeah, there you go, Marlene. Uh, that was Carl Young. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you for the help. Um, so when we are in response to mat mature um, persons, when we're right, then then we ask, you know, we, we ask, OK, um, what part of that was my responsibility? And usually you can come back to is, oh, it wasn't about what you said. It was about what it brought up for me. And I remembered the time that, you know, this, this, and this happened. And therefore when this happened, when you did this, it's, it's, I've got to take responsibility for my reaction to it. Now in a healthy relationship in a healthy state of uh, being that loving parent for ourselves, right. I've told, I've, I've said to several of my clients, your little kid needs a code word. Right. Um, and, um, you know, without revealing this person, their code word was pancakes. And it was, I, I, my little kid inside was like, yes, that's awesome. Because, because here's the thing is 
is it resonates. Nobody's going to really know. Like, why are you scribbling pancakes on a piece of paper? Well, that's that's nobody's going to know. Right. So you're what you're doing is you're alerting yourself into like, oh, my little kid is present and therefore my adult self needs to come back in and, and, and stand and stand in that place because this is not an appropriate time for the child to be a, to be present. Right. So when we have this council of children, um, when we have this council of children, we set aside the time to give these children an opportunity to share their feelings. Um, yeah, uh, Daughters Betrayed by Their Mothers is a really good book. Um, also, Mothers Who Can't Love is a, another really good book. Um, Milk Duds. I like that, Annie. I like that. Um, so, again, we set up these, we set up this council of children, and it's for these little kids to kind of share their wounds, and then we show up to be their loving parent. Hey, Soren. Um, we show up to be their loving parent. And... And we nurture them and we give them, right? We become the parent that we've always wanted. So we have to, we have to do that for ourselves. Um, we have to become our own loving parent and healing the fragmented selves. It shows, it gives us a way. And there's a lot of people out there that talk about healing the inner child and, you know, but it's, it's really confusing because, there's really no step-by-step -step guide into doing that, right? Um, Bubblegum bubble gum sounds like a really good code word, too. Um, so it is. It's about, it's about learning to be that parent that you never had, right? Learning to be that parent that you never had. So let's go talk back and let's talk about some of the, the, um, the trauma bonding. Because when we're trauma bonded, we're little, okay? And so we remind, re, remain in that little state. Um, we stay, we stay in the bond because we're, we're in arrested development. Um, so any that this goes totally back to what you were saying and what I was saying about being stuck in that developmental state, we stay stuck um, in that state be, be, and, and the trauma bond keeps us in arrested development. Yes. Jilligan, that's what I'm learning. Right. I'm saying about learn, learning how to parent yourself. Um, you know, not everybody knows, explains that well. Um, but I'm also talking about trauma bonding and the effects that it has on our brain. Um, and so when we are continuously trauma bonded, um, we stay in this heightened alert. It releases this the cortisol and all these other natural chemicals in our body that keep us addicted to the bond, right? So we stay in this arrested development that we have towards this other person. And really and truly, the bond isn't with the person that you think it is. The bond is with the parental figure that you had, or, or usually it's a caregiver, so it's usually your parent, and, and you stay tied to them, right? And you never move forward in relationship. You never move forward into learning how to interdependently have a relationship. Um, you know, so questions so far. I know this is a lot of information and I'm throwing it at you. And um, so I want to open it up for discussion. You guys give me some of your thoughts. I'm going to grab a drink. Um, give me some of your thoughts about some of the stuff that I've said tonight. Well, we still have a long way to go. Um, anybody? Okay, so ready for the knowledge. Um, so, Andrea, uh, you might want to kind of back backflip and and watch it from the beginning because I went over a whole lot of stuff. Question, how do you practically nurture that child? So um, for me, um, and, and, you know, my method may not work for you, so it's kind of hit or miss because it's you've got to be in tune with what that little kid needs. So if that, need, if that little kid inside of you is just has been longing for acceptance, um, longing for acceptance, that means that you need to work on accepting yourself. 
right? I know for me that um, being good enough was, has always, 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 always been a thing for me. Um, it's always been just like, I want to be good enough. Um, and here's the thing is I realize that just being me is good enough and I don't have to impress anybody else. Um, if I'm good enough for me, then that's okay. Um, I don't have to base my worthiness on what other people um, believe, right? So, so one of the things that I learned in Adult Children of Alcoholics was that other people's opinion of me is none of my business. So, um, a question is, I want to know, can you be trauma bonded with somebody who is not abusive? You can. Um, it, it's, it, it, it's these hormones that go off that there's, there's a negative, they may not be abusive, um, but there's some negative attributes about this person that keeps you enmeshed with them. Right. So, I mean, it could be that just that the relationship is like based on this toxicity overall, they may not be abusive, but it's this, there's this, uh, toxicity in, in the nature of that relationship and that forms the bond right because you're addicted to the toxic stuff and so i hope you know you so oh thank you jay bates <laughs> um all right so let me see um So how do we, how do we retrain our brain? Um, one of the things is that, that we have to do is we have to be mindful. Um, we have to be mindful and, and we have to learn to, instead of reacting, we have to be able to say, I'm going to step back and I'm going to take a breather. Um, and I'm not going to react out of my child right? Because, you know, pancakes, okay, kids out, kids out, kids out. Um, and so I have to give myself a chance to switch back into my adult self, my loving parent and say, okay, this, what did this brought up for me? And, and, and this takes time. It's not something that's going to be automatic. Um, right. It's the inner drama that keeps coming up and it's, um, in the presence, even in, in the presence of healthy people, because we're, are, when we are traumatized as children and we've been abused or in this unhealthy dynamic, it, we're on heightened alert. And even when we are, um, even when we are in healthier relationships, we are still on heightened awareness, Right. Um, because we haven't dealt with this stuff back here, that's why we're always on alert. Okay. Um, and he says, I have had friends that are users and the plus minus example applied where they gave away all and they took always when I put a stop to it, they objected strongly and they do, they don't like it when you take their, your pluses away. Um, dialoguing and journaling is actually is is very very helpful so that's part of that mindfulness is bringing back into into self like and resolving the trauma that's back here okay um mindfulness meditation um one somebody suggested doing random acts of kindness which you know and i mean doing random acts of kindness um that brings me joy like one of the things that really brings me joy is um, I like um, doing benefit rides um, on my motorcycle. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, I don't know the person that we're raising money for, but it's for a good cause. Um, you know, like one of the things is um, here is they, they raise uh, money for kids for back, they call it backpack buddies. And it's raising money for kids going back to school. And I'm all about a worthy cause. Um, and, you know, for one ride that I went on, um, you know, and I've, I've found a love for doing group rides. Um, and and it's just a way to give back to the community. And there's, you know, there's groups that form that do these benefit rides to support things in the community. Um, one of the rides was to um, raise money so that 
underprivileged women could get, um, you know, breast exams during, during um, you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so it's just about doing these random acts of kindness. You don't have to know the person, but pay it forward, right? Uh, and that kind of helps you, you get joy from, from, from doing that. Um, having gratitude. Right. Um, I mean, I've gotten a ton of lately of gratitude for the things that I've experienced in my relationships because it's given me the opportunity to become a better version of myself. Right. It's given me the opportunity for the first time really to be that parent that I needed as a little kid, but never really got. Um, and so I'm having to I'm learning to reparent myself and not being so criticizing of me for the slightest little thing, right? Um, giving yourself permission to just to be a kid sometimes, right? This is part of that self-nurturing, self-parenting is allowing your little kid when appropriate to come out and play. Um, play is a big thing that we who lived as traumatized children don't know how to do. Um, you know, and we don't know how to release and let go and have fun because we are always on guard. Um, as of late, um, I like dancing. I, I throw on some music and I just let myself go in the privacy of my own home. Nobody else has to see it. Um, but it's, it's allowing yourself the ability to play. Um, going out and gardening, you know, getting your hands dirty. That's fun, too. Um, if you like that kind of thing, I, I do. Um, so it's, it's learning how to be that loving parent for yourself and breaking the bonds of your traumatized childhood. And so the only way that you can really do that is it's in, in, in to remap the, 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 your brain, right? Because, um, there is a, uh, you can remap the brain. You can undo and allow the hippocampus to, to grow and the amygdala to, to reduce, right? So the, the lizard brain shrinks and the, and the cognitive brain, um, it's still based in feeling, but it can become more aware into where you go back into your frontal cortex. Um, a couple of things, um, um, Steve said he got a degree in recreation and park admin so he could learn how to play and it didn't work. Um, I'm sorry. Um, probably because your traumatized chick kid was like, Oh, I can't do that. Um, so, um, your lizard brain has a ton of shrinking to do. I know mine too. It's not worried. You're again, you're not alone. So lizard brain has got to shrink. So in learning how to shrink the lizard brain, EMDR has been helpful. I do a practice. Um, it's called rapid eye technology and it, and it does, it helps repattern. Um, unlike EMDR, rapid eye does not um, take you back into the incident to redo it. Um, rapid eye is like, um, right. You need to come at it from within you do. And um, you've got to give yourself permission. That's, that's one of the biggest things for me. I think that, for a long time, I didn't give myself permission to do the work um, because I thought that that was, you know, just I held on to it as my entire being. Like that's that's my story and that's the way it is and that's the way it's got to be. And I didn't give myself permission to do it different. And so as I've been on this journey within, I've given myself permission that I don't have to continue in the pattern that I've always known. Right. And I mean, for me, I can just, I can tell in my appearance, I can tell in the way that I approach things that my, my, I'm, I'm happier. I'm more content. Um, I have more confidence, um, you know, um, you know, and, and so, and it's really because I have the secure attachment to my child self and I'm learning to heal her and releasing her from the responsibility of protecting and adhering to the bond that I created with my mom. Right. Um, meditation does help and learning to watch the thoughts form and, and yeah, right. So you're being mindful of like, like I am, I'm getting better at realizing 
like when my little kid pops out and starts in a reaction and I can go, oh, oh no, let's take a minute and breathe, right? Before I can, um, before I can respond to whoever it is that I'm, I'm responding to. Don't do a hundred percent. None of us are perfect. Uh, I'm, you know, doing the best that I can with it. And, you know, um, Jeb H, you're welcome. I, I am about being authentic and sharing with you guys what I'm learning. And, and I know that this has been um, a lot of information, but it's it's been really interesting and fascinating for me as I've learned about how trauma bonding, how it's had such an important role and, 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 you know, as therapists, we really get into this because we're trying to figure ourselves out. At least that's me, why I got into this. Um, you know, um, we do, I, I did this. I got into this field because I was trying to figure out me. I was trying to figure out myself. And I'm now finally getting to the point where I'm starting to understand myself a little bit better. And and actually having some, some grace with, you know, um, the things that I've done and the things that I've allowed to happen to me and what the things that I've created and set up for myself. And, and it's learning to like, you know, not overshoot and in, in, in creating equality in a relationship, which I've done, I've overshot many times, but it's, and it's saying, okay, well I did that. Um, shit, that sucks. Um, so let me bring it back and let's, let's, let's see what we can do. Um, and it, you know, it is what it is. So, um, seeker says just joined you play important. Um, play is important, but so difficult. Everything's so serious and heavy need to lighten up, break over responsibility, uh, the, the trance and whoever you were expected to be. Right. And you know, that's, that's a, a key thing is who you're I, over responsibility trance. I like that because we do, we get into this. I got to fix. I got to fix. I got to fix. I got to give, I got to give, I got to give. And I learned not to ask for anything, right? Because again, this person over here on the minus side, they take it, take it, take it, take it, take. And we, um, we never learn that it's okay to ask for something in return. We are we're always used to this person over here, you know, is always used to giving, 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 giving. And when giving isn't enough, we give some more and then we become depleted. And then, you know, um, when we become so depleted is when we withdraw and, and then it's like we, or, or we leave, right. We leave the relationship. Um, because we're, we feel like the only way that we can regain ourselves and healthiness is to remove ourselves from the situation. So Soren says, when I go on vacation, I set aside a day to cry because I feel so guilty that I'm taking time and money for myself. Wow. Soren, that's, that's deep, man. That's deep because, because you were taught that that wasn't allowed and that wasn't okay. I'm really glad that you're um, allowing yourself that time and, you know, that kindness and tenderness with that little one. Um, Mama Tara says everyone has issues. Some choose to do the inner work and others choose denial. And that is true too. But here's the thing, not choosing is a choice. Remember that, um, you know, I used to think that, Oh, well, if you didn't choose, you know, you, you still, you, you just didn't choose and no, not choosing is a, cho is a choice. And, and, you know, um, and Jilligan says, right. I never learned to ask for anything either from my childhood. Well, I learned that I would regret my kind, um, regret any kind of attention for my, from my parents. And, you know, that's, that's really sad. Jilligan, um, I, I am familiar with that, um, experiences you, you learn, not to seek anything from the parent. Right. And so again, here form this trauma bond, which you carry along with you and your little knapsack with you to every relationship is that you learn not to ask to have your needs met. And then you get to this healthy relationship and they say, what do you need? And you're like, I don't know. What do you mean? What do I need? I don't need anything. 
right? I provide myself, you know, everything that I need. What are you talking about? I can ask for something from you. And, you know, um, it, it's kind of like, I didn't know that I was allowed. Right. And then, you know, um, so giving yourself permission to, to have needs in, in the midst of a relationship, right? Um, Stockholm syndrome, um, it's really momentary. It's Stockholm syndrome is different than trauma bonding. Um, Stockholm syndrome is more of a bonding with um, the abusers. You fall in love with them and then therefore, um, then therefore defend them. Now, I had been in once in my life in a in a Stockholm syndrome situation um, where the abuser I protected. Um, but um, trauma bonding is more a, through an attachment style with um, your caregiver. So there's there's a difference between between Stockholm syndrome and trauma bonding. Trauma bonding is an attachment style. Stockholm syndrome is more of a protective thing, right? So we, we get Stockholm syndrome when we are um, having an abuser and we fear for our life. And then therefore we, um, we protect them at all costs. And, and we can form that in our parental relationships, but more it's the trauma bonding that we carry with us. So, um, don't ask, uh, uh, okay. Um, Jilligan, Sarah, it's hard for me to receive. It's to be honest, I don't really even know how to ask Sarah, Sarah says, and, and with men in particular and, and Sarah, go back and look at the relationship that you had in your childhood. Um, uh, Mark says crying is refreshing and, uh, revealing, uh, it, it changes and relieving. <laughs> I can't talk tonight. Crying is so refreshing and relieving. It changes your body chemistry. You know, I believe in a good cry, but I was also taught um, crying was a sign of weakness. And that's something that I'm having to undo for myself. Um, you know, one of my biggest things, I don't have to cry to be heard. And that's, that's, um, that's because I get pissed off. I get pissed off when I start crying because I'm like, that is a sign of weakness. And that's what I was taught. And, you know, I'm learning to undo that. Um, but it's not a hard, it's not an easy thing to unlearn. Um, it's getting better. Um, okay. J Bate says having needs is one thing and being needy is something else. Please comment. Yes. Having needs. Okay. So, Let's go back to um, Peyton's killing the little squeaky mouse again. I forgot to get him up. So, um, sorry if you hear the cats meow. She's uh, she's getting me a present for later. So back to Jay Bates' um, question: neediness and being overly needy. So neediness, healthy neediness, is um, is is where the pluses are going back and forth, right? Overly neediness is where the person with the deficit keeps asking the person with the pluses, keeps asking them for their pluses and they're not giving any pluses in return. So that's overly needy. So that's the, they're depleting the person with all the pluses and they're not learning to sue some of their own needs. Okay. I did. I hope that helped. Um, Having needs is one thing. Being needy is something else, right? So being needy, being needy is being dependent on other per people to supply you with your self worth. I guess if that's a better explanation. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Annie says so the best counselor I ever told me was doing something loving for myself every day, and I burst into tears. Right. Um, lizard says my not mom continues to dismiss me and tell me I'm wrong and unstable. And that is why I'm trying not to attract by, by a trauma bond. That's why you're trying not to attract by trauma bond. Okay. Lizard is it's again, it's about healing yourself in the real from the trauma bond. So separating yourself and ungluing, unsticking yourself. Um, 
Um, I don't know why it's so hard for us to love ourselves. For me, it's suppo um, I suppose it's because I never felt loved growing up, Jilligan. And that's that's really true. When you feel like you're inherently flawed and, you know, I mean, I know for me, it was mistake number one was I was a girl. Mistake number two was I looked like my dad. And, um, you, you know, so, so I've already got two strikes and, and I'm, I'm just, just being born. And, and so, you know, when you're told that you're inherently flawed, you begin, you believe that because that's the only feedback that you have. And so until you're out of, again, ungluing the trauma bond, ungluing that, um, then you start to learn that you're worthy and you're inherently good and so it's all this shame that you keep in, in pushing on yourself and pushing on yourself and pushing on yourself. It's false. It's like we're believing the things that our parents told about us. And so undoing that is the cognitive behavior, right? I like to tell people, you know, get a sheet of paper and, and you know, write down on one side, you know, um, the th what, what the thing was that the lie basically is the lie that the parents told you. So like my mom said that I would never amount to anything. That was one of the like things that she would like to do. And she'd tell me, you're never, um, you're, you're never, do they sell trauma bond solvent? Yeah. I wish Jelligan. I really wish I would be in so much less pain, um, if they did. Um, but so like the things that my mother would say, right. Is it, she told me I'd never amount to anything. And then all the things that happened to make that true, right? That that evidence that that was true. And then go on the other side and, and say um, that I will become something. And then let's give all the actual proof, right? Because what's over here is what was made up, the, the falsehoods. But over here is this, um, is the evidence, right? So for me, like I never amount to anything. Well, I was on the Air Force soccer team. I went to the military. I was this, I did this, I, I do this. And so that's the actual hardcore evidence, right? I was able to get my degree. I graduated from high school on time. I did this, I did this. So, so the cognitive comparison is that, well, really this is a lie because I have true evidence that this is what successful means. It, it means, you know, I look up the definition of success and I kind of like check some of these marks. Right. And so really, um, is what they, what my mother told me true. Well, as I've now learned, no, it is not. Um, so you have to cognitive, be aware. And this is, this is again, where the trauma bonding has formed, where the lizard brain has taken over and we haven't learned um, our innate value, right? We're still operating in the things that we, the, I like to call it the shit that I was told. And really and truly I'm walking, I'm, I'm cleaning off my shoes. I'm stepping out. I might just leave my shoes there. Cause you know, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty stinky. And you know, I might just leave my shoes in the shit and, and walk away from it because it doesn't serve me anymore. Right? So when it no longer serves you, your highest and greatest good walk away from it. Um, all right. So, uh, we're 58 minutes in. Um, I know that I've captured you guys' attention. Um, you, you guys have any thoughts about what I've said? Um, any questions, any comments? Uh, Mark, you can chime in. Um, I have an attachment disorder from abandonment issues. It totally sucks. I bond too fast. And animal lover, that is a classic um, characteristic of forming a trauma bond is it happens fast, right? Um, it is, it is, it does. It happens really fast. And that's, you know, um, because it's familiar. That's why, that's why it happens so fast is because it is familiar. It, it reminds you of the relationship that you had with that, that traumatizing parent. Um, let's see. G Marie says, I was so badly abused by multiple caretakers. Caregivers. I, actually ended up underachieving and that's not that's not unheard of Jim Reem so really sorry um yeah but that's a, Soren says yeah that's a good way to put it I tell myself I'm giving my mother back her shame that's a good thing um Jilligan says uh but in public he was a great man navy chief oh yeah um 
I've had my uh, fair share of people who act well in public, but behind closed doors, um, that, um, um, yeah, yeah, it, they're not always what they seem, um, you know, they seem like, and that's, that, that is narcissism, you know, they, they are all adoring in public, but behind closed doors, they're not really that nice. Uh, Jay Bates says, Mark, would like to consult you on something at some point. You can listen to my story on YouTube. It's a poetic story. It helps get at the inside awareness. Okay. So Mark, look up Jay Bates, I guess. And if you guys want to look up Jay Bates and watch his story. Um, also, you can you can watch my story. My story is out there too. Um, this is so helpful. I couldn't be more grateful for this live. You're welcome. I'm so glad to be here with you guys tonight. Um, it's been a long time since I've done a, a, a done a video, and to, in all honesty, um, I had some anxiety coming into this tonight. So, um, thank you for the information. Katie says because it's helped me in many ways. Great. I'm so glad. Um, Soren said, same for me, animal lover. I went to many women two days into a relationship, even if she was totally wrong. And we do that. Um, we do that. Um, yes. Thank you. What is your name, Miss Teacher? My name is Rinda Smith. Um, I am Mark's wife. So um, it's a whole show in itself. The masquerade. Yes, it is. Um, animal says, I have always felt like I've had to hide who I really was and act dumb when I actually was quite intelligent. You know, animal lover, that is actually one of the things too, that I have learned is that was a, it's a protective mechanism, right? We act stupid because if we, if we show that we have knowledge, then we're going to get in trouble for it. And so when we play dumb, um, even though we really know, um, um, See, can I elaborate on the fast connections with the trauma bond? Yes, I can. Um, let me finish up with Emma Lover. So, yeah, it's a protective mechanism. We act dumb um, so that we don't we don't get in trouble. We have fear of being greater than the person that we're with. Um, um, so, Mark and Jay Bates are hooking up um, in a in a healthy way. Um, so the fast connection, right? So because we are, um, all right. When we trauma bond, we, we already know this connection. Okay. So, so when we form, when we get into these relationships where it's familiar, of course we go into it really fast, right? Um, we go into it because we know it. And we don't have to learn it. So when we're in healthy relationships, it's really awkward and weird. It's strange. And we take our time and everything else. But a trauma bond is like, Oof, I, this is, hey, I know this. And um, uh, I know this. And this is familiar. And I can do this because I've done this dance my entire life. So, yes, that's why trauma bonding forms almost instantaneously with somebody. when Because you're, you're already so familiar with the, this type of relationship because of how you grew up. Um, thank you, Jay Bates. Um, Annie has a question. Did the evaluation I experienced from my former narc spouse cause me to experience some depression? Is that fairly common? Yes, it is. The, the depression, I think that the shock value of being going through this, and I'll talk about it through like a brain chemistry thing. We go through this idolization, devaluation, discard, and then the hoovering stage, right? And we get caught into this up, down, up, down, cortisol being released, the hormones being released, this being released, all these things. And so we intensify. And then when we take it all away, of course, we're going to go into some kind of depression. Imagine like cold turkey. I mean, I know because there are some people I know that have cold tur turkey quit smoking or even drugs, right? Um, and, and you go into this withdrawal. So, of course, when you're in this withdrawal phase, there is going to be some depression because your body is used to having these endorphins released throughout it. And so, if, yeah, of course, you're going to you're going to actually have some grieving to do from the loss of that. So. Um, all right, let's see. Go down, down. Um, lost Polly. Um, 
Okay, I think maybe Polly was outside and walking and he like lost him. I don't think that like I hope not. I think that I think that Polly just walked off. Let's let, let's just let's hope that that's what that is cuz I'm not with him right now. I'm in a different state. Okay. Um I think maybe Polly just walked off. Like Mark was sitting outside and good because I know that Polly was alive and well earlier today. So we'll we'll keep you posted. I he, don't know. Um, yeah, I think that Polly just probably just walked off. Yeah, that was a little shocking. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, I think he's probably just looking for him. Don't know. All right, so where were we until Mr. Polly probably walked off? Um, so, you know, just to kind of sum it up, you guys, you have to really um, put in some, put, some, you're worth the effort, okay? You are worth the, um, you're worth the effort to put time into yourself, um, to heal yourself, because nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is is going um, to do that for you. You can't depend on anybody else to fix your issues. Um, you can. Um, he ran off from the swan a few minutes ago. See, told you he was outside and he wasn't on his. He wasn't being his leash wasn't being held. Mark, you almost gave everybody a heart attack. I just want to let you know that. Um, okay, so Polly walked off. That was all that was. He ran off. Yeah, no, right? Whew, goodness. All right. Uh, I cry it very easily. Is that part of trauma recovery? It's actually embarrassing. Um, this It is part of it. It's it's part of that grieving. And animal lover, I can tell you that it pisses me off. It, it But it's a part of it. And I feel, I honestly, um, you know, I've had to get over myself and the anger because of what I've learned that I, you know, I have to, you know, um, I have to give myself permission to grieve the tears that really and truly I wasn't allowed to cry as a child. Um, but it's still, it doesn't, no, I, it doesn't make it any easier when you've been told that crying is a bad thing and you've been, you've been adhering to that rule for 40 years of your life. And, um, you know, um, Again, you know, I'll say, you know, I get mad when I tear up and start crying in a conversation because I'm like, well, why do I have to cry to be heard? Right. Um, you know, but that is that is part of that vulnerability piece that you need for yourself. You know, being mocked for crying. Exactly. Um, you know, or being told, hey, I'll give you something to cry about. Uh, well, you know, as a little kid, you're thinking, what the hell? What do you mean being told? I'm going to give you something to cry about. Well, I'm already crying because I'm already hurting. So I don't understand. Right. So you stop. You shoved it. You weren't allowed feelings. Right. You weren't allowed feelings. And and again, this is where we how we trauma bond. And we learn that we don't aren't deserving of anything from anybody else. But we are pleasantly happy to give all our pluses until we have no more pluses to give. And again, we go through all these people who have all these and, and they just take, they just take, and they just take away and take away. And then they wonder why when you're over here, all your pluses, you've only got a couple left and you just limp off. I wonder why you're not giving away your stuff anymore. Um, and so not allowed to have feelings. That's very, from, that's, that's, that's very common, um, you know, in traumatic childhoods. Um, animal says, animal lover says, I was in a domestic violence relationship for 16 years and I'm free and living on my own. Congratulations to you. And recovery is intense. Um, I wish I could cry as it is said, it brings release. It is secret. It, it does bring release, you know, for me, um, and Mark, I'll answer that question in a minute. For me, I think that, um, being told not to cry it's an ingrained thing and and it's really hard when you start to cry you've got to have compassion for yourself um 
you know, you, you, you've, you've got to have compassion for yourself. So Mark's question, how often do you run into relationships like this in your work as a life coach? I work, I run into this a lot. Um, you know, people, because the people that I see usually come from traumatic backgrounds. And so, um, I don't normally work with couples, um, but I, I work with more individuals who have sought out and been in relation in trauma bonded relationships. Um, so I, I work with it quite a bit and, you know, I've had my fair share of these types of relationships too. So I've got experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, oh, see, my sister is attacking me on that stupid game while I'm while I'm teaching and educating you guys don't worry paybacks um congrats and I'm lover I'm, I'm, that's a personal d-day there you go um yeah for all of you um Polly walked off he didn't pass he walked off um all right so that about does it I'm I'm really um I'm really glad that you guys came out tonight and, and, you know, shared and, and I hope that you take something away from, from my presentation about how trauma bonds work and about how we get, uh, how it has the effect on the brain. Um, and like I said, we stay in these relationships um, because we, we stay in these relationships because our, our brains are addicted to, the, the, the adrenaline, the, the rush that it sends to the lizard brain. And when we are in lizard brain, it stops us from using our frontal cortex to think. Um, you know, so again, releasing and, and reparenting yourself and releasing yourself, ungluing yourself. I wish, you know, like Annie said earlier, do they make um, trauma bonding solvent, right? No, I wish they did. Because I think that the world could be a better place if there wasn't so many people that were traumatized um, and in these bonds. Um, and I, again, I just want to say thanks for being here. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, you you can actually email me at Rinda, R-I-N-D-A, at RinspireLifeCoaching.com. You can look me up online. I have a website. I have a YouTube channel. You can contact me through Mark, whatever. Um, through this channel, through my channel at Rinspire. And I'm going to encourage you, if you guys haven't subscribed to this channel or to the Rinspire channel or to actually Jerry's channel, please do so. You can find each one of us. Each one of us are on the live stream. I haven't been here for a while. Um, Katie says, how do I reparent myself? So that's a good question. So um, I'll answer that. What I've done for me and has worked well for me is I have become... I've tried to become the parent that I always wanted, um, not what I was, not what was demonstrated to me. Um, so um, let me see. Uh, I will type in this. Um, there you go. There's my email address. Um, and also, if you go to rinspirelifecoaching.com, you can contact me through that, too. Um, so um, how do you reparent yourself? For me, like I said, I became the parent that I always wanted. Um, I'm still in that process of reparenting and I haven't gotten it down to a, a science, but um, it is dysfunctional. Um, um, but becoming the parent, being kind and compassionate when I didn't have it, um, I'm answering that question right now, Mark. Thank you. Um, Reparenting ourselves is having the compassion, right? Having compassion, um, having the compassion for yourself that you weren't given as a kid. Um, think of your inner child as like your your child, like your son or your daughter, and you know how would you treat them? How would you explain situations to them? How would you? Um, come across to them? Would you yell in shame and tell them that they were stupid? Would you tell that to your own kid? I know I wouldn't. Um, so then therefore now I'm having to learn that, oh, I am my own kid. And so therefore I can't say that, oh, I'm stupid. Right. Um, and so 
learning and also learning how to play. Um, and, and that's something really to explore um, because giving that little kid a release in a way um, to, and, and having a place to play or having safe space to play. Um, you know, again, like I've told um, um, some of my clients, create this council, you know, have a, have a safe space where you set aside a specific time once a week or twice a week if need be set aside time for these little kids inside of us to kind of come to us in a safe place and share their thoughts, their feelings. So they're not popping out all over the place, right? Because our little kid pops out in, in some of the, um, in some of the most inopportune places, right? Um, and, and so instead of reacting and, you know, come up with a code word, like I said, some of you guys came up with some good ones, bubble gum, pancakes, uh, some of the other ones that you guys came up with tonight. And it, and it is, um, I know that one of the things that I taught my daughter was that, Hey, when mommy's talking to somebody, grab my finger and I'll get to you as soon as I'm done talking. And I have oftentimes I've caught myself actually, but you like the pineapple. I've actually like looked down and I'm like holding it in my thumb or my finger. And that's, and that's usually when something has come up for me. So I'll give myself permission once I get finished what I'm doing to check in with myself and say, Hey, what came up? Right. And that's being a good parent. Um, um, yes. Play is playing is important. Allowing yourself to enjoy and talk to others before therapy. I wouldn't say shit if I was in, it was in my mouth, but I know I'm a chatterbox therapy did that for me. Um, no, Mark, my, my email is Rinda at Rinds by Life Coaching. Well, you can reach me at that one too. Um, Diddy says, learning how to play is one of the hardest endeavors I've ever experienced. I was 12 watching young babies cooking and cleaning. Um, Diddy, I can totally understand that. Um, playing, I didn't, I don't think I remember playing as a child. Um, I remember, well, there were some times that I did get to play, um, you know, um, that's another story. Um, but I, my mom had a daycare, a home daycare, and um, she, um, I was responsible for watching the daycare kids. And I think it was maybe eight, nine, 10 years old. I had to cook them lunch in the summers. So yeah, I totally get what you're saying. And, and it was, it was learning, learning how to play was um, hard for me. Um, Aaron says, how do I reparent myself if I'm not entirely ready for kids, but I want them in the future? So Aaron, when, when you say that you are reparenting yourself and when you're not entirely ready for kids, well, so you've got to think of yourself as, as your own child, um, and then start treating yourself as you would want to be treated. Right. So, you know, if, if, um, you want kids, this is actually, um, last question. I don't understand, Mark. Um, so how do I reparent myself if I'm not entirely ready for kids, but what I want, but you want them in their future. Now is a good time to have this inner child because you've already got this kid, Aaron. You've already, the kid is already there whether you want it or not. Okay. So it's learning how to be, um, it's, it's learning how to be present with yourself and treat yourself like the parent that you wanted. Okay. And I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you for your welcome, Katie. Didi says my family called me Cinderella. Um, I can see that. And that's really, really, really sad. Um, Didi, uh, G Marie says, be careful. I made the mistake of dating and having kids with another narc. Oof. Really sorry to hear that. And we'll ever, oh, wow, um, I do that finger thing, too. I have four children, and they would grab a hold of my finger when they needed something. That's, yeah, and, and I catch myself doing that. I didn't realize I was doing this to myself when triggered. And, and, and so that's a good awareness, right? Becoming aware of, like, what we do to soothe ourselves and, and how we're treating ourselves. So, all right, so we're coming up on an hour and 18 minutes. Um, like I said, it was uh, really glad to be here tonight. I, I, I had some anxiety coming in doing the show, but I'm actually feeling better now. <laughs> um, it was great to be here. Um, I'm running out of things to say. So, um, 
you guys chime in, ask more questions. Um, yeah, Mark, do you have anything else to add? Um, you're welcome, RM513. I was glad to do it for you. Um, and like I said, if you want more information, if I didn't cover something that you have a burning question about, um, you know, um, just send me an email and, and I'll, I'll, I'll get with you. If, if you want to, to have a session, um, send me an email and I'll get you set up. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, and I appreciate it. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Um, thank you, Didi. And I hope you guys have a good week. I'm not sure who's doing the show in two weeks, um, but I'm thinking you're welcome, Sharon. Um, I'm thinking that, that the date is June the 9th, if I'm not mistaken, is the next show. It's in two weeks. Um, take care and have a good couple of weeks, you guys. Good night.